So I'm a developer at Pivotal Labs. I've been working on Cloud Foundry for the last six months or so. Uh, it's been a really fun system to work on. It's a large distributed system written in Ruby that's a platform as a service. I'll get into a little bit more about what it is as a talk goes on. Um, I wanted to go over sort of the bad old days of what we talked about yesterday, which was how we deploy applications if we're not using PaaS, which is first we get to write the code, which is what we're spending the two days talking about. And then we have all of these other manual steps that we talked about yesterday. Uh, provisioning servers, installing the runtime, installing databases, setting up DNS, setting up load balancers. All of this stuff is stuff that some developers really love getting into, and some developers would much rather not have to, talk, not have to deal with it at all. So sort of the new workflow that we're looking um, a lot, sorry, a lot of times I've worked on small startups where we've used Heroku, and the first day we deploy and it's one, you know, it's, it's 30 minutes to deploy. And then if you work for a large company where you're still in the old process, you feel like this is what their data center still looks like. It's a data center out of the 1950s where you file a ticket and the operator will get back to you when it's ready. So we have a new plan for deployment, which is steal the underpants, deploy code, and profit. I think there's one step in here that we don't need, but I haven't been able to figure out which one it is. So what I like to say is there's an app for that, and it's Cloud Foundry. So what Cloud Foundry is is a system that mimics what you see, or which makes it very easy to deploy applications. You want to be able to give it code, and you want to see your application running on the internet in a matter of minutes. Uh, it's entirely open source, and the vast majority of it is written in Ruby. So uh, I think a lot of developers sort of get started with Ruby on ra with Rails, and they've seen web apps written in Ruby. They may have seen a couple gems, but this is a system that looks entirely different. It has all sorts of Ruby daemons, a lot of them, most of them written with event machine, a lot of them communicating over a message bus, um, and have, having very little UI aside from monitoring and monitoring endpoints. So, but for the vast majority of it, it's Ruby. So it's really fun to go through. It took me probably a week before I had any idea what I was looking at when I first started looking at the code. I sort of sat down on my computer and like, well, let's start setting it up. And a week later, I sort of came back and was like, oh, I've got it set up now. So my goal with this talk is to sort of give you an idea of what these components are that you have to set up and how they fit together. I'm not going to go into all the edge cases because we'd be here for a week. Um, the first part of Cloud Foundry that you encounter is a simple gem. Uh, we recently renamed this to CF because VM, it used to be called VMC and we didn't know what VMC stood for, so we figured CF made a lot more sense. Uh, this is probably the most clear Ruby code in the system. It's a gem. <laughs> we're, as Ruby developers, we, we're used to dealing with gems. We know what they look like. You do, gem, you do gem install, you download it, you run, you run CF, it tells you what you need to do to interact with the system. And once you enter commands, it eventually assembles your commands into HTTP requests that it sends up to Cloud Foundry. Uh, it's pretty easy to work with. Uh, we've recently rewritten a lot of this. Um, there's still a lot of refactoring to go, but it's getting better. So this is sort of the diagram that we have right now, what you've heard about so far is we have some developers and we have a CF gem. They're out on the internets. This doesn't get you very far when you're trying to deploy an application in the cloud. Uh, you can enter some commands, but eventually nothing actually happens. So we're going to need to add something to this. The component that we add is sort of the central brain of Cloud Foundry, which is an API that we call the Cloud Controller. This is a Sinatra application that's also written with Event Machine that sits on the message bus as well. So it can talk to the rest of the distributed system, but it also talks to the outside world. The Cloud Controller's main responsibility in the whole system is maintaining the desired state for what the system should look like at any given time. So if you register with the Cloud Controller, it should know that your user exists. If you create an application, it knows how many the application's there, it knows how many instances you want of an application, it knows how many URLs you want mapped to that application and what they should be. Uh, the Cloud Controller, and then once it sort of knows the state of what you want it to be, the Cloud Controller takes actions 
uh, to try and keep the state of the system in sync with what you've told it to do. Um, the Cloud Controller used to be written in Rails um, uh, with Event Machine as well. It was recently rewritten in Sinatra with the SQL gem. It's a little cleaner. I think the, there wasn't really a good reason to use Sinatra or Rails other than it's just an API, so people thought they didn't need Rails. Uh, I wasn't involved in that decision. I tend to like Rails for APIs, but it sort of proves that it doesn't really matter which one you're looking at. Most of the code ends up looking the same. Um, so what we end up with is a system now that has users out, in the, or users out in the world with their CF gem installed, and they can talk to this cloud controller that's running in the cloud. So what they do is they send a message up to the cloud controller. This is an HTTP REST call that says, I've got my Hello World app. We're going to pretend it's a Sinatra app as well. Could you, here's the code for it, and here's the URL I'd like running for, the, I'd like to be able to access this app. So if I go to helloworld.com, or .cloudfoundry.com, I should be able to see my app. So cloud, or the CF gem uploads the code to the cloud controller, which is great because now the cloud controller has this code and we're ready to go, except we're not. Because what we have is code. And what we want in our terminology is a droplet. Because as many people know, when you have code, you can't just download it and run it unless you're only using the Ruby standard library. <laughs> most of you are using gems, as we established earlier. Um, and most of you want to use a specific version of Ruby, not just whatever one we happen to have installed in the system. So what we really want to do is take any code that has been uploaded into the system and transform it into something that we can run. Uh, so what we have is what we call a staging process, where we take the code and we run, what we actually do now is that we run the same code that Heroku uses when they're building your apps. We, uh, oh, for quite a while, had separate implementations of uh, what Heroku has build packs. We had staging libraries. And we took a step back a few months ago and said, it doesn't make sense to maintain two things as open source projects that do the exact same thing. And we said, let's use Heroku's. Uh, as a side note, we said, we don't like how they do Java. We're going to do Java differently. But we're gonna, for Rails, what Heroku has done for Rails makes plenty of sense. It's exactly what people expect when they're deploying a Rails app. So what we want to do is take our code, run the build pack, which is really a transformation function, and end up with a droplet. Uh, the goal of a droplet is that no matter what you uploaded, no matter if it's a Java app, a Play app, a Scala app, a Go app, uh, it doesn't matter. What you end up with at the end is something that you can untar and call start on and give it a port. And it'll run, it'll run on the system and start up that app. Once you have this sort of abstraction of, I have this thing that I can untar and call start on, you basically have something that looks very much like an executable. Uh, it doesn't, you've compiled it down into something that's binary compatible with your system, and you can run it anywhere. So the challenge for doing this staging, this staging process is that we need somewhere to run it. Uh, we need to be able to run the code somewhere, and we need to be able to run the user's code, which means the user's code could be doing anything it wants to do. Uh, this is, frankly, incredibly scary to take user's code and run it in your system. So what we have ended up at is a, a component that we call the DEA, or Droplet Execution Agent. Ah, thank you. <laughs> uh, which is where any, any user's provided code is going to run. Uh, the DEA is another Ruby daemon uh, written with event machine that listens on the message bus. It has no other UI. But, so what you end up doing is you run this on a, on a server, and you also run on the same server Warden. Warden is a daemon that we wrote that is very similar to LXC, or if you've been reading the news lately, Docker. It uses the same technologies. How many of you are familiar with C groups? Some, but not all. OK. C groups are awesome. They were originally contributed to the Linux kernel uh, by Google. And Google just sort of sent the patch over to the kernel and said, here, use this. And nobody really knew what to do with it exactly. Uh, shortly thereafter, the LXC project sprang up to actually make C groups usable. 
what you end up with when you have a C group is being able to launch, launch processes on a box and lock them down into a jail where they can't see anything else on the box. They're in a truded file system, their process table only has their processes in it, and they even have their own network card attached to the system, and they use virtual networking to actually attach to the host system. Uh, so it sounds very much like virtualization, except that you, you don't have your own kernel running. You're actually sharing the kernel with the system that's running. Uh, this means they're extremely lightweight. We can spin up one of these in about two seconds, and, uh, and it'll be ready to go, ready to run a ready to run user's application code in a fairly secure manner. Unless there's a kernel vulnerability, you're not going to be able to get out of the warden container. So what we have is we have application code. We get this message. Uh, that slide doesn't believe it. We, the cloud controller sends a message to the DEA, which says, here's some application code. Could you go and stage it for me? And call it hello world. The DEA will spin up a warden container. So the cloud controller talks to a different box over the message bus. That box will then go download the code, put it in a warden container, and it will start running the build pack associated with that application and transforming it into a staged droplet. So once this is done, the DEA will then respond back to the cloud controller with I took that code you gave me, I made it into something that you can actually run in the system, here's the URL for it. Um, so this comes back into the cloud controller, separate box, and it says, okay, great, I need to do something with that. So it says, okay, I need to actually find somewhere on the system to run this and tell that DEA to actually run the application. Uh, this is sort of an interesting problem because you have to find somewhere in your large system where you can actually run this application. Uh, we've actually gone through a couple different algorithms for selecting where in the system to place the app. The first algorithm uh, used a time delay to indicate how busy the system was, the individual DEA was. So we would send out a broadcast request to the entire cluster, uh, who can run this app for me? It you know, fi needs 512 megs of memory. And each DEA would calculate a number based on how busy it was and sleep that amount of time before responding back. This was a very nice heuristic, but as soon as you have any sort of network delay, it becomes a challenge because the ones that are further away from the cloud controller never have to do any work. The ones that are right next door to it have to do all the work until they get loaded up. Uh, so we recently rolled out a change to this uh, selection algorithm where the DEAs actually broadcast into the system uh, regularly with how loaded they are. So how much memory they have, how much memory is in use, and similarly with the CPU. And then the cloud controllers all keep an in-memory table of all the DEAs they've heard, back from, they've heard from recently and how loaded they are. So when the cloud controller goes to start up an app, it can actually look at its table and say, I've heard from 50 DEAs in the last minute. This one has the least load in it. Let me send it a directed message over the message bus to start this, this app up um, and start it. Uh, when it goes to do this, it also passes the environment hash of what we want to start up with this app. So if uh, you, wanna, you often want to set Rails end and you want to pass in what database it is. This is another sort of situation where it's starting to look very much like an operating system, because now we're passing it an executable and an environment, which is exactly what defines a process when you want to launch a process on your local box. So it's very much the same thing, but we're doing it across any number of nodes. We don't care where in the system it runs. We just know that we need n copies of this, of this thing, this process running with this environment. So we send this startup command to the DEA. And this is really about what our system looks like at this point. We've got our users, they're using the gem, they're talking to the cloud controller. The cloud controller talks to the DEAs, and they spin up apps, and this is great because now we've got apps running. Uh, what you can do at this point is you can mine bitcoins pretty effectively. <laughs> Unfortunately, what you can't do is actually have any users hit your app because our app is sort of running in the forest with no way to get to it. So what we have to do is introduce another component to actually route traffic to this application. And we call this uh, conveniently the router. Um, 
the current one is called Go Router for reasons I'll get into, you can probably guess. Um, but we haven't come up with a better name. We don't really think it's a mesh yet, so we're not calling it a mesh, and besides that's taken. Uh, our router is random, if you ever, before you ask about it. Random works just fine, but I don't want to get into it any more than that. Uh, the routing layer is actually a really interesting part of the system because it's part of the system that's evolved quite a lot since the system launched. Uh, when we first, when Cloud Foundry first launched, the routing layer was simply a Sinatra app that would take incoming connections. It would know where in the system the, app, uh, the various apps were, and it would proxy the connections through. As you can imagine, Ruby isn't the best language for uh, being in the request for every app coming into the system. So what we, the next generation of the router used Nginx with, Lu, with Lua scripts embedded in the Nginx config to actually do a request outside to a Sinatra app that was running on that exact, on that box locally that had a routing table of all the apps and all the ports in the system and where they were. So every request coming into the system would hit Nginx, it would go through Lua, it would go out to Sinatra, it would come back into Lua, which would tell Nginx where to forward that request onto. This was actually much better than having Ruby doing the actual proxying, but it still left us with memory usage issues with Nginx, memory usage issues with Sinatra, and not really the greatest experience overall. And from the product side, we also wanted to start supporting WebSockets, which wasn't something we could do with Nginx at that point. Um, I think as of a week or two ago, you now may be able to support WebSockets, but this was a little bit further back than that. So the third iteration of the router, uh, we actually took a step back and we ended up rewriting it in Go. So the, the router that's running now is written entirely in Go, and it's a pretty simple piece of code that listens on a message bus and just proxies requests through. We've been really happy with the stability of it. And I think we're sort of looking at Go as being sort of this alternative language when we need it. But it's not, there aren't very many components in the system like this that actually need that high performance, high scalability. Because most of this is, uh, most of this is really just a thin layer around a whole lot of computation that's going on in user apps. This, the amount of resources we use for running Cloud Foundry should be minimal compared to the amount of resources for all of these applications that we're running in the system. So once we have this router, we can have a message from our DEA. Our DEA has now downloaded the application code that we've staged. And what the DEA does is then call start on that. It says listen on port 3002. <coughs> And it actually waits for that container's port on 3002 to actually be listening for connections. Because we don't want to start forwarding traffic into an app before connections, uh, before it's actually listening. So we wait for that thing to start listening on a port. And then we send out a message on the bus to all of the routers in the system. I'm over here, here's my IP address, and here's the port it's running on. We also have to set up a NAT forwarding rule into the container from the DEA. Because the DEA is what has the public IP address, the containers don't have public IPs. So much like your home router, we have this whole little separate networking system inside each DEA, and we need to set up port forwarding along that. So what this ha once this happens, the router gets this request, and now when you hit helloworld.cloudfoundry.com, the request will come in and get routed, uh, will get routed to your application, correctly, the, request, the response will go back through the router and out to the clients. So we finally have an app running and accessible in the cloud. And this is great. This is great, and this is about what it looks like. You can see the things uh, fully filled in here. Uh, the sort of interesting part that I left out earlier is that the cloud controller actually functions just like any other app in the system. It doesn't run inside of the DEA, but it registers with the routers just like any other app. And so all HTTP traffic to the system comes in through the routing layer and gets forwarded off to either running uh, either applications that the system's running or it gets forwarded to the cloud controller to actually deal with requests that the end user is making. And so that's about the steady state of the system. As long as everything goes according to plan, we're in great shape. We're going to be running forever. We'll have the one copy of your app. It'll be great. It'll be great until you have an AWS issue. And trust me, you will have an AWS issue. 
at some point in the future. Or in your on-premise cloud, you will have an issue. But at some point, things go wrong, and the system gets out of sync. This may be, you know, one of the simplest case here is that one of your DEA, DEA nodes just disappears. And in a large system, one of your nodes are, di your nodes are disappearing all the time, and it's something you should be counting on. And so what we have is a component that we call the health manager. And the health manager is an interesting component in the system because in a perfect world it does nothing, but in the real world it does quite a bit. And what it does is it listens on the message bus for everything that's happening in the system and tries to build up a picture of what it actually sees in the world and what's actually happening. And then it goes and asks the cloud controller, what did you actually mean to have happen here? And so, and it has these two tables, and it basically just reconciles the two tables and says, well, you're supposed to have three copies, but you only have two. Start up, and it, then it sends a message to the cloud controller to start one more. Um, there are all sorts of edge cases here that you tend to uh, not realize at first that you have to deal with. Uh, if the user pushes a new version of the app, uh, you may only upgrade three out of four copies of the app, and the fourth copy may just never actually get upgraded. And so you need to actually look at uh, what version of each application you're running and go through and kill old ones and scale up, scale down, uh, and deal with the imperfect world that we live in. Uh, the health manager is really interesting because if you're interested in learning more, uh, you can go read the README. We recently spent a lot of time actually documenting how the whole thing works. This is sort of going to be the model for how we document all of the components going forward. We haven't been great about it before. It's sort of been this black box of repos on GitHub. And one of the, our, our product team was actually complaining that it was impossible to figure out how these things went together. And we were like, well, just put a story into Tracker and somebody can spend half a day documenting it. And so we actually did. We had two people go through and really detail how it works. So it's a fun read if you're looking for something like that. So the one topic I haven't covered here terribly and I'm not going to go into in detail is services. Uh, what we've gotten to now is something that can run application code but has no persistence layer. Um, it's not terribly interesting from an application developer perspective if you don't have a persistence layer. With Cloud Foundry, we actually have five services that we deploy. We run a I could name uh, Postgres, MySQL, Mongo, RabbitMQ, and Redis as services. These are all very small, sort of not production grade services at this point. Uh, we, what we find when people really go to use Cloud Foundry at a larger scale is they end up calling out to a, larger da a different database cluster that they're managing by hand. A lot of people want to deploy databases on real hardware or they want to have people looking, uh, really managing them, and that's a hard problem. And so we're looking at that and sort of looking to see uh, where we should invest time to make a system that can automatically manage a database, much like we're automatically managing apps. But right now we just sort of have this naive view that, well, since it's a VMware project and we're using vSphere high availability, any app, any instance that crashes is just going to come back somewhere in the system. In the real world, we don't want to count on that. And we want the system to be able to detect when a Postgres database goes away and actually transfer load to a different Postgres database seamlessly. We're not there yet, so um, it's, but we're not there yet for reliability, but we do have code that allows developers to actually have a workflow of, I need a Postgres instance, let me provision one, and when I'm ready to go to production, I can actually provision one outside of Cloud Foundry. So for me, this is a really exciting problem to work in. Um, I really enjoy being a developer, but I enjoy operations a lot. And I think it really is where the two tend to meet. And it's a really interesting use of Ruby because there are all these different components that are talking to each other. Um, and it looks nothing like any other Ruby code I've seen. And so it's a really, it's a fun thing to dig into. It's a little challenging to get started, but I encourage everybody to check it out. Um, and if and get involved, look at it. There's a mailing list uh, you can find if you have any questions, or you can, even better, you can find me tomorrow at the Pivotal Labs Drink Up, which is after the conference. And you can find my slides online, and you can find me on Twitter. So thank you very much.